Good. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Raul Garcia Patron and I'm senior lecturer at the University of Edinburgh and I will be sharing this session. So our first speaker today is Armin Tabacoli uh, from Ikoki in Vienna. And he will be talking about correlation entanglement assisted prepare and measure scenarios. So Armin, your the ground is the floor is yours. So thank you for introducing me. Uh, good morning and good evening to you all, whether in the in the conference location or not. I'm happy to be able to give this talk on correlations in entanglement assisted prepare and measure scenarios. And this is the collaboration that uh, we have been pursuing with my collaborators, Jeff Powers, uh, Eric Woodhead and Stefano Pironio at the University of Brussels. In this work, we are interested in examining a very basic uh, resource in quantum information processing, namely the conjunction of entanglement and quantum communications. Both of these resources are very well known, have been studied for a long time, and are in a sense paradigmatic for quantum information processing. Typically, we have studied them very well, but separately. On the left here, we have the seminal scenario for studying entanglement. A source distributes two shares of a system that is entangled to two observers. They can perform some measurements locally and record their outcomes. We study the correlations between their outcomes and we learn something about the underlying physics. These scenarios are ubiquitously used. They appear for entanglement detection, for quantum steering, for bandwidth locality, and many other problems. The fact that they share entanglement is, of course, crucial, but almost equally crucial, especially for problems like Bellman locality, is the fact that these scenarios feature no communication at all. On the right, we have, if not seminal, then at the least a ubiquitous scenario for quantum communications. A sender prepares some quantum states, selected from some classical alphabet, sends a quantum message over a channel, it's received by a receiver who can choose between some measurements, perform it, and get some correlations with the sender's choice of input. In a scenario like this, in order to do any interesting physics, we have to make some assumption on the channel. And the most popular and by far most well-researched type of assumption is to limit the capacity of the channel, more specifically to limit the dimension of the quantum message. These scenarios, of course, feature quantum communication, but so far, they have typically been studied either when the devices, the sender and the receiver, are independent of each other, or at most classically correlated. What we are interested in here is to merge the two, that is, to have both entanglement and quantum communications. So the scenarios that we are interested in, they pretty much look like this. A sender chooses from some classical data X, creates a quantum message of a limited dimension, sends it over the channel to a receiver, the receiver selects a measurement from some classical alphabet Y and then produces an outcome B. And to assist the whole process, the parties may share a quantum source of correlations, that is some entangled state phi. The fundamental question that you encounter in these scenarios, regardless of what you want to use them for later, is to characterize the set of predictions that quantum mechanics allows you to make. Specifically, what are the correlations, that is the probability of having outcome B conditioned on the sender choosing X and the receiver choosing Y that can arise in these scenarios when the receiver and sender are quantumly correlated? This is what we are trying to address in this work. Naturally, a scenario that features both quantum communication and entanglement should evoke some associations to quantum dense coding which is by now a fairly textbook level protocol. That is a stunning example of what this type of resources can do for us. By sending a qubit alone over a channel, we know from Hollevo's theorem that we can never send more than one bit of information, but we know from dense coding that if we assist the qubit with a maximally entangled qubit pair emitted from the source, we can double the capacity. An important reason, or important fact related to this is that the dimension of the message can be the same as the dimension of the state. That is, if we have infinite entanglement, it doesn't help us in sending more information over the channel if the channel supports qubit. That is, you can never get more than two bits of information sent in the quantum case. You have a symmetry between the message dimension and the entanglement dimension. But in our more general scenarios, in which you can typically ask multiple questions on the receiver's end, we want to see if the landscape is qualitatively different than dense coding or not. 
beginning with addressing whether this limit on the entanglement dimension can be preserved? The answer is no. The landscape of entanglement-assisted quantum communication is in general richer than what you encounter in those coding. And to show it, I give a simple example. Here I have a, one task that I have put into two pieces just to present it a bit easier. The first part is a so-called quantum random access code. The sender, Alice, has four different symbols, and the job of the receiver is to recover one of those symbols when you decompose them into a bit. So when y is equal to one, you want to learn the first bit. When y is two, you want to learn the second bit. The channel supports a qubit and is assisted by some entanglement. That's the first piece of the game. The second part of the game is that the sender has yet one more input level, called number five here, and the receiver has a third measurement. And when you do the third measurement, your job is to discriminate this fifth setting from the other four. And here you try to do both these tasks in parallel. What you find is that there are three types of categories of quantum entanglement assisted protocols that one wants to take into account. The first one is those based directly on dense coding. That is, you use the dense coding scheme to transmit two classical bits of information, and you can do the protocol rather well, about 88% success probability. But you could imagine that maybe there is a smarter protocol based on qubit entanglement, but not with, uh, not with the same unitaries and the bell measurement that you encounter in dense coding. Maybe you can do something smarter. This turns out to exist, and it can boost your success probability above the dense coding limit. But the crucial fact is that if you go beyond this idea that there must be a symmetry in dimension between the state, uh, between the channel and the entanglement, you can go even further. By using high dimensional entanglement that is then compressed into a qubit, you can get even stronger correlations than you can in the qubit cases. So what this tells you is perhaps counterintuitive. It is telling us that even if we have high dimensional entanglement, and even though we have to compress it here at the sender side into a smaller quantum system, even though we are losing coherence, we can still get more powerful correlations. So in the sender's end, one qubit is effectively being binned and the other one is being set to the receiver. The lesson here is that higher dimensional entanglement is a resource for lower dimensional quantum communication. So now when we know that we cannot restrict ourselves to say qubit entanglement or generally have the symmetry between the dimension of the state and the channel, we want to address the general problem, that is to characterize the full set of correlations in the scenario where the entanglement dimension is potentially unlimited. So there is no assumption on the quantum source here. In full generality, we want to address the correlations in any input-output scenario, so any alphabets on the letters here, for any given message dimension, that is how much the channel supports, and both the case where the message is classical and the message is quantum. And we approach this in two different methods. Both are based on semi-definite relaxation methods, but they are also very different from each other and of independent interest. And I will get back to why you should care about both of them soon. The first one is based on a so-called navasquez pironio asin hierarchy. Here, the idea is as follows. So first, you can imagine that since we have no limit on the dimension of the entanglement, we can as well imagine that the, the encoder is using a unitary process, perhaps with some auxiliary dimension. And then some piece of this encoding is binned and a d-dimensional quantum system is sent over the channel. Some measurement goes on and out comes the outcome B. The probabilities we have here, we can envision them in this form, which I have expanded here. So there is one piece of entanglement shared between system A and B. That's phi coming from the source. Then we can have a local ancilla created by the, by the sender themselves. Some unitary is used to, uh, to process the share of the state together with the ancilla. Then the measurement takes place on this system and we sandwich it. So we get our probabilities. As a shorthand, I just write it on this form where the subspaces are implicit. Now what we want to do is to define a parameterization of the message space, which we know is d-dimensional. In order to do this, we use a cross operator formalism. So we define these effective operators here, ua and nb. This one lives on space a, so the share that is going to the left, and this one on space b, the share that is going to the right. They are directly related to the actual unitaries and measurements that are taking place in the physical protocol. The reason we use them is that we effectively want to discard the message space in our, in our description. If we use these operators, we can write the probabilities in this much more handy form. 
Now the measurements and unitaries are gone. They are replaced with our new effective operators. But now we have a bipartite structure in our, um, uh, in our uh, description of the probabilities. Of course, the fact that the U's were initially based on unitaries and the M's were originally based on measurements has some consequences. The unitarity of the underlying operators here gives us some simple constraints on what these effective operators have to uh, admit. And similarly, the completeness and normalization of measurements implies that our new effective M operators have to satisfy a number of relations. Now, we have a tensor product structure, which we have to address. And the typical way of doing this is to relax tensor product structure to commutation. That is a relaxation of this form here. Once one does this, one encounters a non-commutative polynomial optimization problem. And these are precisely the type of problems that the navasquez pironio acid hierarchy of semi-definite relaxations tells us how to handle. So what we are effectively doing here is that we are reducing the problem of our interest to an NPA type problem and can then recycle these types of methodology. A big bonus here is that we know that this method converges in the limit of, uh, in the, limit of the complex STP relaxation. The second method is to be viewed as a complementary one to the one I first presented. This one is based on a completely different physical idea, namely one of informational restrictions that we developed here in this work cited down here. Let us momentarily forget about the problem we are interested in and ask a different question. Imagine that the sender has some data X and the receiver wants to recover the data. So the job is basically an encoding decoding problem. To assist the encoding decoding, we have an entangled state and a channel supports either a quantum D-dimensional system or a classical D-dimensional system. How well could we ever hope to decode the message of the sender in an optimal quantum protocol. This is closely related to uh, quantum state discrimination. And the probability of doing that discrimination is given here. So you want the message, you want the, the message to equal your output, and you want to get as, do this as well as you can on average. Now it turns out that this quantity, this so-called guessing probability of state discrimination, can be related to a simple information quantity. Uh, one of accessible information phrased in terms of mean entropies. So this, qu this quantity is one-to-one -one with the ability to perform the state discrimination. And now we ask ourselves, how well could we ever do this in a quantum or classical protocol? A simple observation that should be familiar directly from our knowledge of channel capacities is that a classical entanglement-assisted D-dimensional communication can transmit at most log D bits of information. And that if you upgrade it to a quantum channel, you can also double the number of bits. This you can prove quite straightforwardly also in this uh, one-shot setting. So based on this, we recycle ideas from informational restricted correlations. The idea is this. This is the scenario we care about, entanglement-assisted quantum communication. Now we relax it to a scenario that doesn't feature any entanglement. Instead, it's a simple prepare and measure scenario with classically correlated devices. But instead, we say that the channel now supports system of arbitrary dimension, but its information content, its capacity, has to be limited either by log D or two log D bits, depending on whether the message is classical or quantum. Now, this information-based scenario, we already have efficient semi-definite programming tools to deal with it. So we can efficiently compute it and thus put bounds on the original problem of interest. So let's take a look and compare the two methods. On the left, we have the one based on a reduction to an NPA type uh, STP relaxation. And on the right, we have one based on a reduction to an information theoretic uh, STP relaxation. The advantage of the left one is that it's converging. If we go sufficiently high in complexity, we will eventually recover the actual physical set we're interested in up to the commutation tensor product structure. On the right, this is not possible. We have an explicit counterexample. However, these approximations are typically rather accurate. In our case studies, they are about 98 to 99% accurate. So they're certainly useful. However, the drawback of the NPA-based method is how the size of the problem scales in terms of computational requirements. In the classical case, that is when the message is classical, the number of operators you have to deal with scales linearly in the dimension. In the quantum case, it scales quadratically in the dimension. But if you take an information-based approach, the number of operators you have to deal with is independent of the dimension, regardless if you're doing the classical message or the quantum message. 
So what it tells you is that the left side is optimal, whereas the right hand side is very practical for actual computations. And we can put it to use in a concrete case. So I give you just one application of this framework, and that is the device independent dimension witnessing. Device independent dimension witnessing is a protocol first or introducing the prepare and measure scenario in this work here from 2010. The idea is that you assume that you have a sender and a receiver and you don't know what, how they operate. So they operate black boxes. And by studying the statistics, that is the correlations between B, X, and Y, you want to put a lower bound on the dimension of the physical system that was sent from Alice to Bob. The typical way this has been done is indeed to assume that the that boxes are uncharacterized, but to assume that they are either independent or only classically correlated. However, a fully device independent treatment of dimension witnessing should not make such assumptions. It should allow for the full power of quantum mechanics. That is the scenario in which even the boxes themselves are quantumly correlated in principle with any amount of entanglement. And this is what we want to address here. For sake of practicality, we focus on a specific task in which you have five, uh, five symbols on the sender, four on the receiver, and the two outputs. So for each X and Y, you can associate an expectation value. And for each expectation value, you can give it a sign and then sum it up and call it the correlation function. So this one we are inheriting from the previous work of uh, Gallego and co-authors. So in that work already, they studied how well you can perform this task if you have a classical channel and no entanglement. So then you have a series of bounds for a two-dimensional, three-dimensional, four- and five-dimensional classical message. You can also do the quantum case without entanglement. Then you have a sequence of better bounds. So you have a qubit, a q-trit, a q-quart, and a five-dimensional quantum system. And you can see that in each case, you have a considerable improvement. So the spirit of these witnesses is, for example, that I go into the lab, I measure, uh, I measure this witness, I say I find a nine, then I say, well, Qubits are not compatible with the network, so at least I have certified a Q-trit. The issue is that once you take entanglement into account, you have to revise the analysis in a fully de device-independent picture. So these are the revisions that are demanded by the possibility of having quantumly correlated devices. In the classical case, but now with entanglement, you have two-dimensional, three- and four-dimensional systems. In each case, you have a considerable improvement to the classical case. So for instance, if you indeed observe that your witness gives a value of nine, you might falsely conclude that you have certified a three-dimensional classical system, whereas it's actually completely compatible with the two-dimensional one if you had entanglement to assist it. This also highlights the difference between the methodology. Here we have put the best method that we have been able to compute in each case. For the smallest problem, the NPA method, which we know eventually will overtake the information-based one, does better. But limited with our standard computation power on an ordinary desktop, we found that already with a three-dimensional system, the information approach gives us better results. In the quantum case, it's the change is even more radical. If you have a three-dimensional quantum system going over the channel, assisted by entanglement, then you can do dense coding and send the entire input and trivialize the whole problem. The only interesting case is if you have a two-dimensional one, and that gives you a radical improvement against an ordinary qubit channel. So in order to revise um, the device independent dimension witnessing, one has to consider the full power of entanglement. So now I give a brief outlook on where we want to go with these, these investigations. In fact, we have a really a large number of open questions, uh, so many that we wrote a whole paper about how many questions we have and how few answers we have. I highlight just a few of them. A basic question is that whether there exists a sufficient entanglement dimension. First, we suspected from dense coding that we could restrict the channel dimension to be the same as the entanglement dimension, but we know now that that is not true. Does there exist a sufficient entanglement dimension? And if not, it means infinite dimensional entanglement is useful for entanglement assisted communications. Something more we need is that we took a very much STP based approach to these problems but developing analytical methods for self-testing in, uh, in these types of entanglement-assisted problems is a very natural thing, especially if we want to later move towards semi-device-independent protocols for quantum key distribution that are robust to the possibility of entangled devices. A more basic open problem is to understand the relationship between correlations supported by entanglement and the channel capacities that they boost. 
And lastly, I would remark that here I have only talked about systems that are limited in dimension that are sent over the channel, but the landscape of semi-device independent quantum information is much richer than that, and it would be interesting to base entanglement assisted communications also on other types of assumptions. So with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Armin, for this uh, uh, nice talk. Um, so now the floor is open for questions. So I, uh, we have a, a chat that you can use uh, on the website of the conference to ask uh, questions. And I will be reading them uh, as they show up. Okay, so for the moment there are no questions. Uh, so maybe I can ask a question myself first uh, while we are uh, waiting. So maybe uh, it was not clear to me the, the example you were giving the previous slide. Uh, Armin, so, so do you hear me? Uh, yeah, so yes. so in the, so this W uh, that you are bounding, what is uh, what is exactly quantifying in this example? So this W, we are inheriting it from this previous work. So what they did in this previous work is to take this specific scenario with this number of uh, inputs and outputs, and then they computed the optimal, optimal facets of the classical polytope. So these are the optimal tests of classical correlations. And this is a, this is a correlation function. So it maps all these probabilities to a single real number. And then you see how well you can perform that task by trying to maximize this number. And this is the thing that we call W5. But operationally, what does this quantify? What does it tell me about the protocol or what? Because it, it, like um, usually in dimensional witness, you want to kind of have a, a guarantee on what is the maximum dimension of the system or something like that. So so what is the, which dimension are you bounding here uh, in the protocol? Yes. Yeah, so here we, we bound the whole sequence of dimensions. So, so here we have a two-dimensional classical one, three-dimensional classical, four-dimensional classical, and so on. The task itself just happens to be an optimal test of correlations, but then we can analyze it for different dimensions. That's why we have these sequences of bounds for the case of classical and quantum systems, one by one. OK. Um... OK, I see there is a question. So we can maybe uh, ask this question. That's more, more uh, interesting than, than, than mine. So um, the question is um, for Ernest, uh, does anything change if you require Alice to produce an output as well? Uh, we, can so we can discuss further, but um, so if you allow for Alice to, for having an output, what does it change uh, to, the, to the scenario? Well, qualitatively, so if I go back uh, to the original one here, Qualitatively, what happens is that instead of running a simple encoding that we are doing now, so a channel that takes you from a perhaps large dimension to a small dimension, you have to run an instrument that also spits out an outcome. Now, that's actually an interesting scenario that we have been only thinking about, but we don't really know much about, so we can't tell you anything concrete yet. But what is expected to happen is that you should encounter something that is a sort of hybrid between a communication task, that is something like this, and a well-known locality test. And here, defining the notion of classicality that you're interested in, that's also in itself not trivial. And it's probably going to give rise to a fauna of different notions of classicality, some based on non-locality, some based on the quantum communication, and some perhaps in between. This is very much an open problem, and I'm keen to discuss it. OK, so thank you, Armin. So I, I, we need to close the session because we, the next, uh, I mean, this talk, because the, the, the second talk of the session starts now. So I will, uh, we will have to leave now the session. We will close the, 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 the recording. Good. So thank you, Armin. Uh, I jump to the, to the other session, OK? Um, thank you. I need to. I stop the screening, which should show.